So, uh, Professor Oppie, on again on on the note of Good L, um, just a bit of a segue here. Um, well, it's really interesting. You you gave this talk um, regarding the incompleteness theorem. So, just for the for the listeners, so the two theorems would say that the first one is the idea of self-reference that any uh, formal system uh, it can tell truths about itself that set outside of the system, kind of the, I, I, uh, and then the second one is. Uh, a system can't prove its own consistency. Uh, now, of course, this, this is on the on the, the face of it are the limits of uh, formal systems. The kind of what Gödel intimates at. But then uh, I'm wondering, firstly, uh, what are you, what are you, what are you, how do you think the relationship between uh, Gödel's theorems and then our epistemology is like? What are your intimations on that and would you say that uh, a limit on axiomatization is, isn't really a limit on our knowledge, as in there are things we can know outside of uh, axiomatic systems? Well, I mean, there's quite a lot, quite a lot to say here. So, yeah, please. Um, let, let's so so let's go back a bit. The way that I'm, the way that I'm thinking about um, the the Gödel result that I'm interested in talking about is that it says that there's no um, um, complete recursive axiomatization of arithmetic. Uh, um, to avoid explaining what um, recursive means, let's fudge a little bit and pretend that it's just saying there's no finite axiomatization of arithmetic and we're fudging over some stuff that really isn't going to matter for the purposes of the conversation, I think. Okay. Now, on the face of it, that doesn't seem to suggest any limitations on what we can know, right? Um, unless you're thinking that the way that we know things is by deriving them from axioms. But as Russell pointed out a long time ago now, like, like in 1905 or something, it's not plausible even that mathematicians proceed that way. And uh, it's rather that when you're making an axiomatization, um, it's a constraint on the axiomatization that it gives us back the stuff that you already know. Kind retro retroactively. Right, yeah. right. So um, famously in Principia, Russell and Whitehead take about three hundred pages to get to the proof that one and one are two. But it's a good it's a good thing that they get there eventually, right? Because if they if it had got to that point and they'd found that their axioms entailed that one and one are three, that would have been really bad. And if it had turned out that you couldn't derive one and one or two from their axioms, that would have been equally bad, yeah. right? So. The, um, so it's not, I don't think that there's kind of even prima facie plausibility to the idea that the way that we acquire knowledge is by making inferences from axioms, even in mathematics, never mind more broadly. And so it's not clear then why um, there being constraints, you know, you know um, on axiomatization that we can't make a finite axiomatization of arithmetic, it's not clear that that's got any implications for epistemology of mathematics or for epistemology of anything else. So that's the kind of simplest point that I make in the talk. Indeed, indeed. But also as a philosopher of religion, apropos epistemology, you also uh, do mention that, well, if you could bring in the, the arguments that some people have tried to claim that, you know, the, the Cuddles and completeness theorem in, in some way points at God or some kind of uh, super entity. But then, of course, you say this is not the case. So if you could just uh, comment a bit on that. So it's not. So so what am I going to say now? I mean, it's not clear why you would think that it pointed at God, right? Um, there's nothing in the argument that says that that establishes that there are propositions that we can't know 
right? So that there's there are particular propositions that we can't know. What it what the what what is true is that if you've got a particular formulation of arithmetic, so think about piano arithmetic, there will be true claims in arithmetic that you can't derive from those axioms, right? But it doesn't mean that you can't. I mean, if we if we find a claim that you can't derive from um, the piano axioms, it doesn't mean that we can't prove them in some other way, that we don't have some access to them in some other way. And in fact, it seems that that's actually the case, right? So there's this work that was done by Paris and Harrington in the 70s, which was actually based on very similar to work that was done in the 30s, not long after Gödel produced his original proof, where um, you can point to mathematical results that we know are true, but you can't prove them from the piano axioms, right? The fact that you couldn't get to them from that, you know, you, your, your axiomatization of arithmetic was incomplete. There were things that you couldn't prove from that axiomatization, did nothing to show that you couldn't access those truths in some other way. Right. And it would only be if, you know, we were born and the piano axioms were hardwired into our brains and we couldn't add anything more to them, that that particular claim would become one that was inaccessible to us, right? But it's not like that. So it doesn't follow, at least not, not yet and not in any straightforward way, that there are claims that we can't get to. Now, I spend most of my paper arguing that actually most of arithmetic is inaccessible to us, right? Um, for kind of boring, mundane reasons. But I don't think that anybody's going to take that as a kind of reinstating a proof of the existence of God. So, I mean, just to give you a flavour of the thing that occupies most of the, the talk, um, think about simple arithmetical sums where you add two numbers to make a third, right? And think about um, your ability to understand a sum like that. If it's two digits, two digits, and either two digits or two digits plus a one in the, the, the furthest column to the left. Those sums, we can look at them and we can just sort of look at them and kind of intuit straight away whether they're, you know, a sum that's written like that is true or false. 23 and 46 are 91 not true right i mean you can just you can do and maybe you can do this for three and four digits you won't get much further however we have other techniques pen and paper if i write you out 50 digits 50 digits and either 50 or 51 you can check it it's going to take you a while it's kind of boring right okay now let's ramp it up a bit um a google's quite a large number 10 to 100 Let's imagine 10 to the Google, right? So let's go big. Now think about a sum where, and I'm not thinking about one that's easy, like a one followed by Google zeros plus two <laughs> followed by Google zeros yeah. equals three followed by Google zeros. Okay, fine. One where you can't compress the, the, the information in the digits. One of those sums, right? There are lots, there are, there are sums out there, right? There are truths, they follow from the piano axioms, right? Whether any one of the huge number of those sums that there are is, is a theorem or not a theorem, depending upon you know, the particular choice. We can't grasp any of them. We can't assess any of them. Imagine, so I imagine God making a big steel plate with one of these sum, one of these potential sums on it, with a string of Googleplex digits, another string, a line, another string, and there's a walkway, and he puts you in the middle of it, and says, "Okay, your job is to determine whether this is a theorem or not, right? And you can walk a tiny fraction in either direction before you die, right? Your three score and ten years or whatever the year allotted will elapse, and you'll have examined almost none." of the sum, right? It's obvious that there are, I mean, I mean, to go back to a point that maybe I could have made before, um, if we went up not to a Googleplex digits, but say roughly 10 to the 80 digits, and if we think of needing a bit to represent each digit, there aren't enough elementary particles in the universe <laughs> to enable you to represent that sum, and that sum's tiny compared yeah. to the Googleplex one, right? So, 
I mean, so we can imagine a scale where we kind of measure, we, we rank people according to their ability to comprehend sums of a certain size. So we're obviously we're greater than two, maybe we're at 45, though that seems questionable. We're certainly not at 10 to the 80. We're certainly not at 10 to the Googleplex. We can imagine creatures, but whatever creature we imagine, there's going to be some finite limit. And beyond that, are going to be most of the sums because that's an infinite thing, right? And you've got some tiny finite section down the bottom. I mean, it sounds big if it's 10 to the Googleplex, but that's still essentially measure zero compared to the whole thing. So basically, we know nothing about arithmetical sums. Doesn't bother us. Does it prove that there's a God? I don't think so. 